Hey folks, Matt from Art of the Image, and today is the first day in our new interview series, interviewing photographers, videographers, image creators from everywhere around the world. Today we lead off the series with Stephen Frischling. That's fish to his friends. He is the travel photographer, the travel guy who hosts TNI on Twitter and he is uh, his website is flying with fish we'll put the links to these below and without further ado let's get into our uh, conversation with Stephen I'm sure you'll find it interesting and here's fish okay so I've got uh, Stephen Frischling I call him fish as most people do right fish that's it <laughs> Um, why don't we start with uh, some of your background and uh, you can tell us how you got into photography and uh, your background as a news photographer well, if you ask my kids, I started with glass plates somewhere before the Civil War. <laughs> um, but the reality would be uh, I started as a news photographer as a kid in New York. I was uh, either lucky enough or unlucky enough to uh, grow up one block from a shopping mall in New York that for five years in a row had more stolen cars than anywhere else in North America. <laughs> so finding news was not very hard for me. I would just get on my bike and go find news. Um, but I, I came to news photography uh, at 10 years old. I was uh, in the Valley Stream Public Library in the children's section, and I found a copy of uh, Life magazine with a, a photo essay from Larry Burroughs called Yankee Papa 13. And I told my mom, I want to do that. And she said, oh, you want to be a Marine, or you want to be a flight medic, or you want to be... The story was about Marines in Vietnam. And I said, no, I want to be the guy who photographs them. <laughs> and... Uh, Kind of been off and running ever since. So Since 10 years old. 10 years old. I saw that photo essay, and uh, I mean, the photos that he shot of that helicopter unit in Vietnam, just I, whatever it was at 10, I mean, there's the photos of the, sh the sheer emotion of guys breaking down, the sheer violence, and everything in those shots spoke to me. I said, I want to do that. So how long after was that was it that you got your first camera? I was 10. Oh, you got one right at 10. I got a scanner in a pawn shop when I was 11. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was it. What? Do you remember what the first camera was? I still have it. in a 1965 Nicomet FS. Nice. It had no light meter, no hot shoe, no X socket. And you probably got some great photos with it. Who knows? My first couple of rolls were Kodachrome because my dad said, oh, your photographer's just Kodachrome. Uh, and since it had no light meter and I had no background, everything was, was totally exposed wrong. <laughs> so, but to this day, I don't necessarily need a meter when I shoot because I didn't have a meter for the first two years I had a camera. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. What? Uh, so what would have been your first paid position then as a, as a news photographer? Well, paid or first sold photo. Okay, let's start with the first sold photo. First sold photo... Uh, would have been, I don't really quite call it a car attacking or car theft gone wrong, but a couple of cops and a guy faced down at the, the Green Acres Mall in Valley Street. So that so then you basically started out freelancing, selling to papers? Dropping them off at the Herald. And did, how long did you do that for? Uh, started when I was a kid. I sold my last photo of them in, I'd say, 1997. Um, so, a long time. I mean, 97, I was old. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in my 20s, so... So, at that point, well, you were probably doing other things as well, then. I started selling spot news to the AP when I was 16. I started shooting regular assignments for the AP when I was 18. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, it was, I was a news junkie. Still, I'm a news junkie. I've, I'm, I'm finally having the flexibility of my time to get back to being the news junkie. I've never stopped being. So you're, are you still selling freelance, or is it all your own projects now? No, my local paper, I'll end up with uh, 3 a.m. arsons, 1 a.m. house fires, abductions, kittens being rescued. I hear it, and it's interesting. I'm showing up. And and they and that's just to clarify. That's still paid work. Well, that's still paid work. Yeah, I've had a very unusual non-relationship with the paper where I am now in Connecticut. Of uh, 
I've only lived here 11 years, but I mean, I've, I've, and I've only really gotten back into newspaper work over the past year or so, but I've known the chief photographer for 20 years. Their chief videographer worked at a paper in Vermont when I worked in Vermont at the same time. Uh, their director of photography was on the international desk at the AP in New York when I was freelancing for the Metro desk in New York. So I had a very odd non-relationship with this paper, even though it's here. I mean, like, it was just, I'm here and I seem to have known these people already. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I get the fun assignments like, oh, there's going to be a major blizzard. Why don't you go cover that? <laughs> and that's it. I'm out and the, the worse it is, the happier I am. Oh, it's interesting. The the reason I asked if it was still paid is because I know nowadays it seems like it's it's hard to actually get paid to submit to a paper. It is, you know, and the rates have gone down, and it's not necessarily, you know, I mean, I get paid, and I'm happy I get paid because getting paid is good. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I like the hard, I, I do other news work now on my own for projects that I work on. And things I'm trying to figure out, but it's hard to say. I love the 3 a.m. house fires and shootings and abductions and car wrecks, but I love that stuff. That, to me, is it's where I started, and um, I like doing it. So what percentage of what you're doing currently would be that that's still shooting for the paper and the news? Uh, a very small percentage. Um, my projects now... Are, are very different than where I started and are, and are very unusual. Um, uh, I did a project for a Sky Team, uh, which is an airline. 20 airlines from around the world make up an airline alliance. There's Sky Team, One World, and Star Alliance. I, I do work with Sky Team. And uh, in August, September, in 12 days, I went around the world shooting in 15 cities, 13 countries, 5 continents. Uh, and I did it all with two iPhones. Oh, that's the iPhone project, yeah. Oh, is it? I've done other iPhone projects as well, and I've, I've likely have another one coming up. Now, I should probably clarify, because uh, some of the listeners won't know, but that's, I'm assuming that's part more of you're into a lot of social media and social media management now, right? It is. I, I well, I mean, I, I've been a contract photographer, a staff photographer, a photo editor, a chief photographer, and while I'm 39, almost 40 now, at the ripe old age of 30, I had my last full-time job as a shooter, having already shot for many years. Um, I was a director of photography overseeing five international business magazines um, with a staff you know, of, of editors and contract shooters, and then I was downsized. The magazine decided that they were merging the art director and the director of photography because we we're both visual professionals. <laughs> uh, the art director couldn't shoot, didn't know much about <laughs> photography. Uh, I couldn't lay a page out to save my life. And somehow we were merged. Even though longer he survived, uh, I left. But, I mean, that was <laughs> interesting way to, you know, thanks for coming, get out. The term Sound. they gave me was, um, oh God, was it, it was like corporately repositioned or something like that. Like, I'm repositioned to the parking lot? I mean, where am I going? <laughs> Unfortunately, oh. that sounds uh, more more normal of what's going on these days than, than the exception. Uh, that was 2005. That was 10 years ago for me. Yeah. Uh, and I ended up for reason still not necessarily known to me, ended up building social media for Oasis Hong Kong Airlines. Um, but I started doing social media in 1994 with Kodak. 1994 uh-huh. to 1999. Back, uh, back when uh, social, social media oh, wasn't almost a term back then. It was not a term. Yeah. It, was, it was the American Online Photo Forums. Uh, and then in 1997... In 1998, I went to Discovery Channel for a project called the Picture of the Day Project, which was uh, the joys of the dot-com bubble. Mm -hmm. My job was to photograph whatever I felt like and present one photo a day for their online galleries. But in there, uh, I was the guinea pig for what would become iPix Interactive Photography. 
uh, a FedEx showed up in my house one day with a six millimeter NICOR lens with a post-it note that simply said, figure this out. <laughs> it was a calibrated rotor and you had to shoot following a calibrated rotor with a six millimeter lens following a three, three pattern and then mm-hmm. FedEx your film to a lab in Tennessee and you had no idea what you got until they sent it back to you. And if you made a mistake, they couldn't show you the mistake because the online technology wasn't there for them to stitch together to show you the mistake. <laughs> you would have to just go back and reshoot it and hope you got it right. And the problem with a 6 millimeter Nikkor lens is that I had to use an F3 with no prism and a motor drive because even with a prism, you'd see the camera in the frame. <laughs> That's I mean, crazy. <laughs> Forget feet, tripod legs, your own head, your ability, your baseball hat, you saw the camera. I mean, you got to love a lens that can see behind itself. That is pretty crazy. It was. I mean, it's fun. You're standing in the middle of, uh, like, Copley Square in Boston, setting up this lens that looks like a giant mushroom, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it's a freakishly large lens. And, and um, to put that in perspective for, for listeners that might not be cluing into this, we're talking a full frame lens. At six millimeters. Yeah, so we're not talking six millimeter on an APS-C or something. That's you literally can see behind yourself. That's it. I mean, it is. Uh, it, it, it's it's a piece of work, and it was a lot of fun to shoot with. But I mean, it was great because I got to shoot something that didn't exist. I mean, this was literally Discovery Channel got it and said, "Figure this out." <laughs> and I mean, interactive photography has come leaps and bounds since I did this project. Um, but, I mean, I was there. I mean, and the fact that you're trying to shoot interactive photography on film, <laughs> because the NC2000 cameras were 1.6 crops, and the resolution wasn't there, and an, an old Kodak AP NC2000 camera, they're huge. <laughs> I mean, they're giant cameras. Um, not to mention the whole product was shot on Canon, so the lens wouldn't have worked anyway. So I'm walking around with Canon gear to shoot the project, and I'm walking around with an Nikon film gear to shoot the IPIC stuff. Uh, it was... I looked like a pack mule when I walked out the door. <laughs> you know, it was... I'm um, shooting two kits. They focused in two different directions. One's digital, one's film. Let's go have some fun. And so so, so that, that begs a question that just popped into my head. What, what, what was your first digital camera that you shot with then? Kodak Associated Press News Camera 2000. Not even the NC2000E or C. It was the original 2000. And that was what? Uh, two point something megapixels? No. No? Not I wish. Uh, I think... You know, I don't remember. I think they say it's two megapixels, but it wasn't. Yeah? It was like one or something? It was awful. Whatever it was. <laughs> um, although, I will say, I do miss my NC2000C. Um, because it's a great camera to teach people. And I, I previously, when I still had it, had used it to teach students. Mm. Uh, I worked for a number of years at, at the University of Massachusetts as their primary athletics photographer. Um, and I had that job when I switched Nikon to Canon. And there were two students there who loved my transition because I was shooting pretty much all Canon, which gave them complete access to all of my Nikon gear. <laughs> So these two college students were walking around with 4 2 8s, 3 2 8s. At the time, the newest Nikon D1, D1 H, D1X bodies. Um, and they, was like, they were I mean, kids in a candy store. Oh, you're shooting Canon today? Great. And they would just raid my Nikon gear. <laughs> and that went on for a season. But for a while, I was making them, and I mean forcing them, to shoot with the NC2000s covering things like indoor basketball. Because this thing had a shutter lag. Like, you push the button, you get up, you get a sandwich, you come back. <laughs> and if you're lucky, it clicked again. Um, there was no screen in the back, so you couldn't see what you shot. Um, there was no external battery. There were no swappable batteries, so when your battery was dead, you were done. So if somebody at that point had handed you a Canon T3i, you would have just been in heaven. If anybody handed me anything at that point, when the DCS 520 came out, the Canon DCS 520 came out, with a screen in the back and changeable batteries, it was just like, oh my God, I've just died and gone to Nirvana. <laughs> this was the greatest thing, and the best part of the of the DCS 520 cameras, which most people don't know, is 
the engineers program Pong into it. <laughs> I mean, oh, I'm bored at a campaign stop. I'm gonna put Pong on the back of my camera. That's a awesome. photo of me somewhere on an airfield in Bosra, Iraq, playing Pong on the back of a DCS 520, waiting for a flight. <laughs> Maybe some, maybe somebody from Sony will hear that, and our next uh, Sony camera will have some uh, some Sony Xbox on it or something. Well, Canon had an exact same version of that camera called the D two thousand, and Canon specifically made Kodak remove Pong from the cameras that were branded as Canon. <laughs> I mean, that was the big issue to that. Like, really, it's a game. That's just fun. So uh, <laughs> Canon's history of stripping features goes way back to then. I just like, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, but I wasn't the only one. You look around and it's like, oh, people playing Pong. Great. <laughs> Good day at work. Uh, so that's what I got a $15,000 camera for. So I <laughs> You know, that's funny because talking about all these older digital cameras brings up something I, I know about you, and that's that you have a bit of, you have a trend of not always shooting with the latest and the greatest. You do great work with what most people would term some older gear, if I'm correct. Yeah, I couldn't care less about gear. I mean, it's, it's, I shot a billboard for UMass Athletics with a 2.7 megapixel Nikon D1. Uh, in 2000, I shot a full page for Life magazine with a 2 megapixel Coolpix 950, which is a point and shoot because my two $5,000 each Nikon D1s both fail simultaneously with two different errors. <laughs> and I'm just standing there, I'm 25 years old. You know, you've got the hooks for certain assignments, you know, and some of the back of your head is going, life is interested in this. Um, my camera just failed. <laughs> and I pulled out the Nikon cool pics and shot the photo and full page and live here in pictures. Now, I have one of those, I have one of those older Nikon 900 series. Mine's the one that it twists in the middle. Is that the same one you're talking about? Yeah, uh, if it's got the red on it, that's the 950. I think, yeah, I think that's what I have. It was, it was a neat camera. i got to dig that out now that you say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had that with the screw and wide-angle adapter on the front because there was no zoom. Well, I think there was. I don't recall ever using it. Um, I had a screw and adapter on the front, um, you know, and, and then the night, and I went to the EOS 1Ds, and I, was, I, I did a lot of stuff with those cameras. I was really happy with them. My current kit right now is a, is a 5D Mark I, the original 5D, uh, and a 40D. Um, I, I love have a 5D Mark II. I never use it. I loved the 40D. I had a pair of those, and that was a great wedding setup. I don't like the one point of crop, um, but my other 5Ds have for a pair. I normally sh shoot with two 5Ds simultaneously. Um, but I've had the Mark II, and I don't shoot video. So, you know, the only issue for me really was high ISO, but there are enough software options, and I don't use a lot of post-production at all. I come from the Photoshop world. If you crop, tone, color, correct, and get rid of it. And that's it. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much where I live. Um, but I've been using, like, Noise Ninja and other options like that since the NC2000 and D1, because anything over ISO, like, 200 on the NC2000 was horrific. Yeah. ISO over 400 on the original D1 was horrific. Well, the, um, the original 5D is still pretty decent, even at 1600, is it not? Oh, I published a 32 with fires. Yeah. So not using, you know, I, I don't even carry a flash in my bag. Because um, that's that... really an issue for me. Uh, I had showed up for a project for Oasis Hong Kong Airlines, which is now no longer in business, uh, with a 1D and a 1DS, and no flash. I had a, only thing I packed with me was a 14. 2414, an 85, either 12 or 18, I forget which one it was, um, and a 70 to 200, because I just needed a 200 for the 1X to shoot something long. Mm -hmm. But that was it, simple kit. And I think I shot almost the entire project with a 14 and the 85. But their PR director was saying, how don't you bring a flash? What, like, what are you going to do? And I'm saying, I am shooting onboard aircraft. You can't have me using a flash on commercial flights with your passengers. And I said, the only other thing I'm shooting besides that are 747s on the ramp, because they're whole fleet with 747s. But what's one flash going to do with a 747 on the ramp? Exactly, yeah. And he took a moment to sit back and ponder that, and like, okay, I don't see your point. 
Um, you know, I mean, years ago I had this where I had worked for a number of colleges and I went to go shoot um, a portrait. And I was going to use the 10D over the 1D. The 10D had 6 megapixels, the 1D had 4 megapixels. I found the color on the 10D to be far superior to the 1D. Yeah. And he said, why aren't you using the 1D? And I said, this is the better camera. The guy looks at me and he says, we're paying you for the 1D. <laughs> I have a 10D at home. And I'm looking at the guy back going, no, you're paying me because I'm really good at what it is I do. Yeah. And he didn't quite, like, it wasn't clicking. It was, no, it's not we're paying you. We're paying for that camera. It's like, I can show up and shoot the thing, you know, with anything I want. Yeah. I shot a, a bank robbery on Valentine's morning in my town. Um, and I had the two 5Ds on my shoulders and never picked them up. I shot with a Fuji X20. Mm. Which is like a cross between a rangefinder and a point and shoot. Um, and I love the camera. I use it like a rangefinder constantly. I have the screen turned off. My kids get annoyed when I have them shoot it. I gaffers tape off the screen. They can't even put it on. <laughs> I frequently gaffer snip over the screens for them. I don't want them looking. Um, but the cop who was there saw me a couple of days later and said, oh, I saw the photo in the paper. I never even tell you pick up one of your real cameras. Real cameras, yeah. Like, define real camera to me. I used to get that all the time when I was still shooting a lot of weddings. That would be one of the first questions people asked. What gear are you using? And it always, you know, I always found that funny because really it's like, do you like the portfolio? What do you care what I'm shooting with? That was it. I always, well, that, I mean, I've had a couple of, so what's your kit? All you truly care about for most of these jobs is my lights. I've got significant lights to, sh to shoot whatever you need me to shoot. Everything else is irrelevant for most of these projects. What, uh, well, what lights would you normally use then? Are you mostly into a lot of speed lights or do you have the larger studio flashes you take out or? You know, I've got, I've got studio flashes, but I have dialed everything back at this point to I shoot with a number of um, SB28 DXs. Oh, yeah. yeah. Even though I'm a Canon shooter. Yeah. My speed lights are all Nikon. Yeah, I've got a bunch of the 28 and 26s. They're great off-camera flashes. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Strobist has made them a little expensive now because he's popularized them. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I got mine in 2000, 2001, 1999, uh, you know, so. <laughs> well, for for a while there, several years back, you could pick up a used one on eBay probably for 20, 40 bucks. And ever since David Hobby showed people how great they were, they're, they're going for $150 sometimes for a good one. Yeah, you know, I'm not, it's, I think I paid like $35 for my last couple of. Yeah. You know, I, my, my, my last set of my, my those, it was just, the pocket was just going to cost me more, um, which is fine. So you know, it's, uh, what percentage of your shoots when you're out shooting and whatnot, would you say you're using uh, artificial lighting or supplemental lighting as opposed to just shooting natural light? Almost none now. Yeah. I, really, I really prefer to use reflectors. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I like to, I've, I've got a, not working for one place and being able to do what I do um, has really given me a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. which I like. And I've been able to convert that freedom into other stuff. I mean, a lot of my work now is within the airline and travel industry, even as a photographer. I, I sort of have a dual life. Um, I went from being a shooter to running social media for, for airlines. Um, I mean, a lot of people love KLMs. The Royal Dutch Airlines uh, social media and it gets all sorts of awards constantly and uh, I mean I founded their blog their blog was started by me nobody else I was the only author for its inception uh, I created their Twitter style for 24-7 customer uh, engagement um, and that's I mean it, it was interesting running a global airlines stuff that's that K way. KLM Airlines? KLM Royal Dutch. Yeah. Big blue planes with a crown. Let's see KLM Asia, then there's no crown. That's a whole different issue. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it, and, and from there, I sort of ended up doing photography for some of the airlines. I've done photography for Southwest, and I've done 
it's for uh, other carriers as well. Um, you know, and, and it's an interesting it's hard to figure out my job at this point because I am a photographer, although it's no longer my primary job. And it took me years of doing a different full-time job to realize it wasn't my full-time job anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm not really sure what my full-time job is. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I shoot, I build social media, I cover aviation security as a journalist, I do some consulting in aviation security, uh, and somehow I seem to manage photography getting intermixed with all of that. And I seem to manage getting... I mean, they all are tied together and totally unrelated. <laughs> uh, I mean, my, my, the only way to describe my job for the past couple of years is I build jigsaw puzzles for a living. <laughs> so it, it's uh, it's fun, though, because you know, your kids you used to be, what does your dad do? Oh, my dad, I mean, for years I covered, my daughter would tell people, my dad covers the Super Bowl, my dad covers the World Series, my dad's been to the Olympics, my dad covers the White House, um... That was simple. My dad's got a camera. He does this stuff. Yeah. Now, you know, the, everything in school, what does your parents do? I have no idea what my dad does. I, I totally get that because I'm in the same position. I mean, my kids one minute would tell you I'm a photographer, then they'd say I'm a YouTuber, then they'd say I'm a writer. Like it's Because I'm the same thing. Any project I'm working on, I've got all these things I have done and still do, and you just do what needs doing, right? Yeah, you know, but the upside to what I get to do is um, what I really, I mean, love at this point, I get to watch my kids do it. That's true. I have a, as you know, I have a 14-year-old daughter, I have, then I have a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. My daughter has been shooting uh, since she's two, three. Um, and she's really getting an eye on her. I've, I've really been liking watching her for, uh, photography and the photos she's doing. She got published at four. I mean, you know, you can't really beat that. It's true. Uh, for 14, worked, that's pretty oh, good. <laughs> she came to work with me and we we're going through my takes and I'm like that's not my shot like that's 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 the cover I'm like it is the cover but that's not my shot I didn't shoot it <laughs> she was four years old and she she outshot me on a job I gotta tell you that's really embarrassing to tell a client <laughs> yeah but you, <laughs> but you know what as parents don't we always want our, our our children to fly past what we've done oh yeah you know I mean recently I gotta say I mean as bizarre as this sounds um there is some demented pleasure in watching my 14-year-old daughter outside of a raging house fire in the middle of the worst part of, of, a city near, of a city near me. I mean, dodging junkies with her camera, getting her photos of the fire. <laughs> and I'm just sitting back, and there's one of the cops going, you're going to let her do that? It's like, yeah, she's got this, it's fine. <laughs> you know, I mean, she's... She's uh, she's cutting the path to be the next Barbara Walters when she gets older, you know? No, she likes to shoot news. Well, she might end up liking the interview. Uh, she can do anything <laughs> she wants. She's smarter than I am. Um, so, <laughs> but I mean, it's great. I love watching her do that. I, lo- I love watching her go out. and I, I, You know, she walks out the door almost every day with a camera on her shoulder. That's awesome. And, um... You know, you look at it and go, where have I seen that before? Now, she's got a 5D right now? She's got a 20D. A 20D, okay. Do you, well, she will end up with my 5D whenever I replace my 5D. Um, I will probably give her the other 5D when it comes back from repair. So that way she has a 5D and a 20D. Yeah. Um, although, she's fairly insistent what she really wants right now is an EOS 1DX. <laughs> uh, with her own 16 to 35 and 70 to 200 because she's just tired of borrowing mine. <laughs> it's, uh, but she had a 28-135 or 28-105 mm-hmm. my bag. I haven't even looked. She just stole my 28-72-8, hasn't given it back, told me, we did a swap, I gave you my lens. <laughs> uh, and I, just, I haven't seen my lens. Like, it's just, every time I see my lens, it's just, hanging off of her shoulder. So uh, I think I've lost it. <laughs> now, something you said there, I'm just going to rewind to. When you replace your 5D, I know we're not, I know you're not uh, gear-centric, but I'm just curious, what will that be when you replace it? Probably a 6D. Oh, yeah, okay. I like that the 6D has the Wi-Fi built in. Mm-hmm. I've looked at the 6D and the 5D Mark II and three side-by-side. Um, I see almost no advantage to the 5Ds over the 60s. 
you can buy two 60s for not much more than the cost of a 5G Mark III with a grip. I only use grips mm-hmm. because I grew up using the FM with a motor drive, the FA with a motor drive, the F3 with a motor drive. Um, you know, anything for that short period of time, I used the old Nikon N8008s, mm-hmm. which were smaller bodies. It felt so weird to me. Yeah. I just, I can't do it. Whenever I've, I spent a week not using a grip on my 5Ds um, when I first caught them because they didn't ship together. Mm-hmm. Drove me nuts. See, I'm the opposite way. I've I've gotten to smaller and smaller cameras, and I stopped using grips years ago. So, uh, but I do know what you're talking about. I used to always use one. It's just I've kind of changed that way. But I can't. I've tried. I've tried to shed the weight. When you, I, <laughs> I I travel fast and light. Everything is out, and you know, in a backpack is. I mean, I, going around the world for 12 days, and said, you know. And yet, you can shoot a whole project on an iPhone or a Fuji X20. I could do that all day long. No grips there. Or I had. Um, it's got to be what I'm used to. Yeah. Otherwise, I am just floundering out there. Um, although my 10D, actually, my original 10D still works. My 10D has been to the World Series. It's been to Iraq. It's been to riots. And uh, I've broken probably half a dozen 5Ds. I can't even think of the number... 20Ds and 30Ds are destroyed. Um, <laughs> I've obliterated at least two EOS 1D bodies, and my 10D still works perfectly. <laughs> I Actually, I used my 10D in Iraq because I had two 1Ds, and one of them fried the first day. Crazy, eh? So, I'm sitting there going, great, I have like this $6,000 brick. Um, <laughs> I've had that discussion with so many people because... I've been, uh, well, similar to your story about when you wanted to use the 10D over the 1D, I, what I called an upgrade, went from the D100 to the D70, and people were like, well, that's not as professional a camera at the time, and I said, what are you talking about? It's more advanced, and people get hung up on, you know, having more plastic, and it's not a pro camera, and I've never had trouble using non-pro grade bodies, and I get you know, great images, it's usually more advanced. They don't, they usually, you know, move those lineups down the road faster than they do the uh, the Pro Series. Well, the problem, you know, I mean, when I was shooting news day in and day out for, for wire services and covering sports is, um, I mean, you really beat on your equipment. Yeah. And that, that that's where the 1D bodies, for me, um, came in handier. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they didn't crack. They and were weather-sealed. And the um, shutters are rated so, better. I guess that's probably a, an issue too there. So, so why well, you're you're a place the shutter? Who cares? I mean that that never bothered me. Yeah, uh, I get people who are, who are hung up on like, oh god, the shutters blow out. It's like whatever. It's like you know what? You figure the cost of the camera. If you're getting paid to do it, you got to figure out what that lifespan of that camera realistically is going to be anyway. Um, my bigger problem wasn't that it was cracking the LCDs in the back. <laughs> See. Almost every one of my cameras to this day still has packing tape because I've cracked it somewhere. <laughs> uh, I, just, I just I learned how to order the parts from Canon and replace them with uh, a straight blade. Nice. Yeah, I mean it's it's a lot faster to sit in your kitchen and just pop it out and change it yourself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Canon, but I'm also I mean I I one of the older school guys and you know camera maintenance um, cleaning my own sensors. Yeah. I cleaned my sensors with uh, 91% rubbing alcohol, uh, Kim wipes folded over eight or ten times, jammed into a tweezer, yeah. pop open the shutter, clean it out, and let it go. I mean, that's it. It's it's. Yeah, I've done that lots of times myself. But you meet a lot of people who are, oh, I have to have those specialized, um, oh God, what are they called? They're the, uh, the sensor swabs? Yeah, swabs and sensor, what, and this, and then there's all the people making all the aftermarket stuff, you know? Uh, you know, the swabs, oh, this one's for, you know, the APS side, it's for a full frame. Hey, you know what? If you get a box of Kim wipes for a dollar thirteen, yeah. what I paid for mine, tweezers for three dollars, rubbing alcohol for about two fifty. Um Well what people about- what people don't realize is you're not actually cleaning the sensor, you're cleaning a, a plate in front of it that's almost as hard as a diamond. Well yeah. So Um But I mean you get two hundred and eighty Kim wipes for less than two bucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of those packs of sensor swabs are, uh, what is it, 30 bucks a, a pack, and you get 
like 12, something like that. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> you look at it and go, who can afford that? <laughs> well, you know, if, if you're only cleaning your sensor once in a blue moon, which a lot of people, you know, probably haven't even cleaned it once, I guess. Every Sunday religiously? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, now, um, just back to your bodies for a minute, well, your gear, period. Do you mostly buy used stuff? I haven't bought a new lens in years. I haven't had a need to. I've sold most of my lenses. Yeah. I went through, um, and I realized that, yeah, I loved my 8512, wasn't using it. Uh, I loved my 2414, wasn't using it. Um, and I stripped my gear down. I, I, I use a 1428 a lot because it's fun. I have a 514 because you kind of have to have a 50. Um, but I have three different size macro extension tubes, so my 50 is my macro. It's also my walk around. It's my whatever. Um, I have my 16 to 35, my 2870, my 7200 to 8. And but what I did for my long glass is uh, I use the older Canon 35 350, uh, the 35 to 56 L lens. Oh yeah. And I typically walk around with a 16 to 35 and a 35 350. And what else do you really need? Yeah, that'll get you there. And you're not finding the f 56 too limiting. I, it wants when it gets dark or really dark, yeah. But I mean, I can do a lot with five six in the dark. Uh, you just find a new angle for light. And yeah. Go go play with that. Uh, I mean, I have had a photo enthusiast where I live who was going on about oh, thirty five to fifty. It's not a pro lens because it's five six. Like you're kidding, right? It's a thirty five to three fifty with Canon L glass. Yeah. Like I had the Sigma one twenty three hundred two eight. I loved it. The problem is, if you want to go out, walking around with a 120-328, which is a size of a 3 28 hang it off your shoulder. It's huge. It's not very comfortable after a while. Yeah. You know, the 35-350 weighs about the same as a 7200. It's about the same size, and it's pushed down to 35. <clears throat> so it doesn't really bother me. It's all a matter of practicality. Yeah. Although, my daughter discovered a photo of me at the 2003 Super Bowl with my 600 F4. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know where the lens was. I sold it. Where's the other one? My four or two eight. I sold it, and then she flipped out, <laughs> telling me how I should have kept it because she really could have used those. <laughs> but I don't cover the NFL anymore. I, I covered the Patriots for a number of seasons for UPI, and I covered the Red Sox. And you need those lenses if you're covering sports day in and day out. Um, I don't cover sports anymore. They were just multi-thousand dollar paperweight sitting on my desk. Yeah. They were really cool to look at and play with, but, um, yeah, I can't justify that. Although I will tell you, the one lens I do want to add back into my kit was I had the Sigma 20 F1.8 for a while, uh, and I had sold it for the 2414 from Canon, but I didn't like the 24. I never really liked 24 as a focal length, um, whereas I love 20. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go back and replace that. I am a wide angle, and I, I can do all the projects with an 85 and a 14 and be completely happy with it. Will you buy another Sigma 20 F1.8? Yeah. Yeah? I'm sure I will. I mean, plus, if you buy those things used, they're really cheap. Yeah. I just, I'm curious because that's a lens that I always was interested in, never ended up buying, but I've heard a lot of um, positive and negative about it, so. Well, it's got some lens flare issues. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but sharp enough for you, obviously? Yeah. I mean, I have a photo... Actually, I don't have a photo website anymore. I've been trying to redo it for about a year. Um, I have two people dancing in the rain at 2 or 3 in the morning in Paris. I shot with it. It's one of my favorite photos. Hmm. I had shot a number of weddings in Paris, and the couple it was pouring, and the couple had told me, we're looking for a shot that really is quintessential Paris, but not the obvious, like, here's the Eiffel Tower. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's raining, we're getting married tomorrow, what are you thinking about? And I said, I'm going to go walk around when the rain stops, I'm going to call you, what time are you going to be up? And I said, whenever you find the shot, give us a call. <laughs> so it was like middle of the night, rain stopped, I'm walking around, I see this big open square with a cathedral, and I called them, and they got up and they met me, and they just started dancing, and I didn't tell them what to do, they just walked in the middle of the square and started dancing. <laughs> There's my parish shot. Have a nice day, folks. I'm going home. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, it's a great lens. You know, it was a. Uh, 
And you, you, you obviously then don't have a problem buying used stuff. You just said you'd, you'd pick that one up used cheap, right? You know, I don't care if it's new or used. I don't care how it looks. My my 70 to 200 came back from repair last month. I've had my 70 to 200 since 2002. It's been to every crappy place you could possibly imagine. Uh, it has had cracked cowls, lens cowls on it since 2005, maybe four. I have not seen my lens not wrapped in electrical tape for more than a decade. <laughs> and it came back to me with replaced cowls on it, and it was completely clean. And my kids were like, oh, you got a new lens. I'm like, no, it's the same lens. And they're looking at it going, it can't be. <laughs> like, I know, I had the same reaction. Like, this is what my lens looks like. I've never, as you know, Canon lenses are white. Yeah. My lens has been black for more than a decade. <laughs> what because did, it's just been electrical tape to cover the cracks. What did it cost you to, re- to have that all done? Ah, uh, I love mid-state camera repair in uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, who I recommend everyone should go to. Uh, I think it cost me like 300 bucks. Wow. What was that company again? Mid-state camera repair in Warwick, Rhode Island. Okay, I'll see. Maybe I can... I have no problem being a shill for them. Uh, they are the <laughs> greatest camera repair facility on the planet. I'll see if I can dig out the URL and put it in the uh, in the description below when we, when we get this up. They have fixed stuff that... Canon more than once and said, nope, beyond economical repair. I sent it to them and they go, sure, you can have it back in a week. Nice. nice. Oh, I love them. Always so, good to know a good uh, camera repair guy. Yep. <laughs> always, and always make them happy, too. Um, but yeah, I mean, my gear is, uh, I'm just not a gear junkie. So you're, uh, when you do buy the 6D, that'll likely be a used body? Who knows? Yeah. I haven't decided yet. If I can find them used, that'd be great, too. Yeah. I just, you know, people talk about the shutter, uh, the sync speed, not really an issue for me. Yeah. Uh, the, the frame is per second. I shot the NFL with an EOS 1DS. Mm-hmm. 1DS is three frames a second. <laughs> I know, it always makes me laugh when people are thinking, well, you know, it's, it, this one's faster, and you're talking six frames per second versus eight or nine. It's like, really? When are you really going to, you know, have that be a problem? It has been in limited circumstances, but I mean, I had taught a sports photography workshop for the uh, National Press Photography Association at one point, and a student who was there with us uh, was talking about having problems covering his college's football because he couldn't get the autofocus to lock properly, and then he was talking about the frame rates, and I'm there with two other guys. Um, one guy is a guy named Bob Breedenbeck, the Providence Journal, who was the last of the manual focus photographers. And looking at his stuff week in, week out, covering the Patriots, he would typically have better stuff shooting manual than we all had shooting autofocus. Because <laughs> he was just better than a camera, I guess, or better than technology. He was fantastic at what he does. Well, that's the old days where you'd pick your spot, focus, and wait for the wait for the wait your subject to cross that, that area, no, he, right? He'd follow focus with the 600s. I mean, and he, I mean, he, great. He still is great. He's still there. <laughs> um, you know, and you just look at the student going, you're having a problem because you don't have enough frames per second and the autofocus isn't working. <laughs> Let me discuss covering the NFL with an Icon FM. <laughs> I just note for the for our listeners, if you hear the, that's my wife coming in the door, that uh, <laughs> the extra noise we hear. But, um, so uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it's certainly a different, these days everybody's so reliant on the AF, right? But I, I still don't necessarily like it. Um, I'm teaching my daughter to shoot manual. Um, I'm slowly teaching the 10-year-old to shoot manual focus as well. And uh, does, uh, does Lauren uh, fight that trend? Is she, is she bucking against that? Well, once she got glasses, she got much better at it. Yeah. Without glasses, it was explaining the minor focusing issue she had. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, I mean, no, she's not bucking that trend, and, and you know, she uh, said I tape over her LCD once in a while, and I make her go out, and you, you can't look. You go and shoot, and you've got no idea till you get back, and, you know, she's just like, you, you teach them, if you stop and look at everything, you get so reliant that you can correct them in the field. I don't want them reliant on that. I want my kids who are shooting to be reliant on the light they see, how they think they see it, because... You know, as I'm sure you and most of your listeners know, um, 
your meter's not always looking where you're looking, and your meter doesn't know what you have in mind. It's true. You know, your meter might be looking at it going, okay, I'm going to open it up three stops and bring some light onto the face, and you're seeing a silver letter, you're seeing a harsh shadow. You know, I mean, I'm a big believer in let your blacks go black. Yeah. If, you, if you've got that shadow there, just let it go. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it's a, photography, the styles have changed dramatically. And I think if you look at the photography, especially the news photography, from the 70s, 80s, early 90s to now, you'll see a significant difference in the, the, in the dynamic range of the images. Because photographers now, I think, it's the whole, it's expected that you're going to get that whole dynamic range there. Yeah. Your, your camera's going to do it, your post is going to do it, or HDR is so easy to just tweak it just a little bit to bring it out. Um, you know, and... and well, I... Uh, Ironically, I often think it makes for not as catching a photo. You know, like like you say, let your blacks go black, and and you know, I I think sometimes when you got more punch of that contrast and not showing you two million stops of dynamic range, you you got a more eye catching photo. I think. I I agree. The only time I really see a difference in that is shooting with a phone, and I think it has a lot to do with the limitations of what the phone can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. But also when I shoot for the phone, I'm shooting campaign work at this point, not necessarily news work. Yeah. So it, there's, there's something I think every photographer needs to know is know your audience. Um, I mean, you can have your own style. Everyone should have their own style. Style is something that um, if you've only got one style, you've got one bag of tricks, you've got one bag of tricks, you're not really good at what you do. Yeah, that's true. You're still, <laughs> you're still mimicking somebody else. Well, it's, it's, sometimes you're mimicking yourself. You know, you look at it and go, this is how I shoot, and I'm... I, Recently, I had a conversation with a photographer. I was saying all of your stuff over the past, you know, amount of time here. I always know it's yours, and it's not always a good thing because everything has the same angle. And it, you just look at it and go, "You're always finding that one angle." And it's like that's what I like to shoot, but that's great. <laughs> Except you can't show me the same photo in every place you go. It's yeah. boring. <laughs> Yeah. You know? And he went on the whole, oh, Bresson always used a 50. He did. <laughs> However, his photos look different. Sometimes they look like this. Sometimes they look like that. He had a 50. That's great. He knew how to actually use it. <laughs> and and you know what? That's probably one of the best pieces of advice for anybody that I, I always liked from way back in the day is to find your own style, you know, like shooting your own voice, right? Well, it's it. You know, and, you, and, it, and it's okay. Some people, it's just the whole, this is how I shoot. Like it's okay to have two different voices. Yeah. It's okay to have two different personalities or three different personalities behind your lens. If you shoot one way, that's it. I mean, the way I shoot is how I like to shoot. Yeah. But when I go out and I shoot for the clients I shoot with, they don't necessarily want to see exactly how I shoot. I've got a story to tell, and it's their story. It's not my story anymore. And that is a big difference between editorial and personal work and corporate work. And what I do is not commercial work, it's corporate work. There's a difference in that as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. In corporate work, nobody cares about my voice. I am the, right now, one of the blog things I'm doing for, for the Airline Alliance is I'm writing an ongoing blog series, and uh, over the course of the year, I will have to write it in 18 different voices. Sorry, Fish, I'm just going to pause you just for one sec. Somebody's at my door, I just got to double check this. My apologies. Okay. Hang on just one sec. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> okay. Somebody's for the wife. She's out. She's she went around the side and dealt with it. So, <laughs> the perils of working at home. I know them all too well. Uh <laughs> I actually um, want to go back to a point you said that you don't shoot video ever. So you don't you don't care about that in the cameras. I'm just curious. Do you plan on that being you know going forward? Still not shooting video. Except for the random 15-second videos of my son, Max, making ridiculously funny comments, no. You don't see that as something you'll need in the social media realm or things like that? I don't enjoy it. I yeah. don't like it. Um, and I hate editing it. It doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> what I want to do doesn't make sense. Yeah. I can actually, I've done projects for it. I can shoot the video. Yeah. I don't understand audio. I have tried, and it's one of those things, while I understand it intellectually, I have absolutely no interest in learning how to go any further on it. 
<laughs> and I have tried to learn video editing, and I understand it intellectually, and I've realized that I have absolutely no interest in learning how to edit it. It's, I, I get you on that one, because it's been a big learning curve for me, and I don't enjoy it as much as I used to enjoy all the photography editing I used to do on a very, very frequent basis, you know? That's it. And I came to a point where I realized that I don't need to do it. I, for, for a client, I have to force it. If it absolutely has to be shot, I'll shoot it, but I won't edit it. Yeah. It's, it's just not what I do. I don't, you know, and in social, what's pretty interesting is, is, is um, you know, statistically, if you look at how long people watch videos, yeah. most videos go far, far too long, and people don't realize that. It's, it's one of those ridiculous stats that people just aren't understanding. Yeah. Um, after a minute and 47 seconds, typically, you will see a massive drop-off in video. For sure. And after three minutes and 39 seconds in social, you've lost 90% of your viewers. Yep, it's a two-minute rule for sure. So, I mean, I, and you look at the numbers and go, okay, at a minute 40 seconds, I've lost half, half my audience. Yeah. And I've learned that really anything over that 15 seconds in Instagram, unless you've got something really going on, if you can't tell that story, you've lost at least a quarter of your audience. Yeah. And once I've lost a quarter of my audience, I don't really want to tell the story anymore. So for me, what I come back to, and, and, and you know, something that's hard for a lot of photographers, photographers, especially in journalism, don't typically think about metrics and ROI and the rest of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Because we're art people, and I really can't stand thinking about it. I have an idea in my head, you know, and the Sky Team project I did around the world, when I did it, we vastly exceeded our metrics, but nobody understood the project. And I was sent off around the world with nobody understanding what I was about to do. <laughs> it, was an, it was an incredible leap of faith for an airline alliance to go, we have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but as a global brand, we're going to say, sure, go for it. That's awesome. I mean, you're going to do what on Instagram? I don't understand. Whatever. Uh, so... I mean, there's also obviously a level of trust in years of knowing people to, to make that happen. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it's one of those things where I come back to the video end of that of, like, I'm working for now, so like, okay, we want these videos, and I want them to be five-minute videos. Yeah. You don't want them to be five-minute videos. Like, no, the idea is five-minute block. It's okay. I will work with you if we can make them 30-second blocks. Yeah. And they're just saying we can't tell the story. Like, if you can't tell the story in 30 seconds, nobody cares. It's true. And, you know, going to your point, too, of that and not liking editing, it, uh, just a little sidebar, but uh, Tim Ferriss did an interesting experiment. Are you familiar with him with the four-hour work week, four-hour body? Yeah, I've heard it, but I haven't really paid attention. Well, he had a, a video. He was based, he, he, does every, he experiments on everything to get the, the data to see if it's true or not. And anyways, he'd done a, a video with a full production crew, spent a lot of money, and he got a lot less views on that video than when he posted one with his brother-in-law just filming with a, a handy cam as if it was just, you know, your everyday user that you or I could do. No editing, just as it was shot. And the final kind of consensus was is that people find those videos more engaging because it looks more real, like something... Well, that was the whole gist of my Sky Team thing what I'm working on now as well. And that was a hard thing to get people to wrap their heads around. They had an idea of producing photos. And I said, no. And one reason I wanted to use the phone wasn't the easier access to Instagram. It was when we talk about travel, which is the industry, and I work in almost every aspect at this point, people need to put themselves in that photograph. Mm -hmm. People want to be where they are. And I said, okay, so shoot yourself. I'm like, no, no one wants to see me. I want to be where I am. So we're going to shoot everything in what I call a visually accessible style. You know, and that's why I ended up shooting the whole project. And if you go on Instagram, they can go to Instagram, they can look up Sky Team Alliance. Uh, and you'll see a couple hundred photos of a Timbuktu messenger bag going around the world. That's a Sky, Sky Team Alliance on Instagram? Yep. Okay, I'll see if I get that link below, too, so they can check that out. And we chose the bag. <laughs> Because a bag has to travel. 
And yeah. a bag has no personality, although we gave it a personality. And at the end of the project, we had a couple of thousand requests to buy the bag. Uh, <laughs> from what I understand, made Timbuktu really, really happy. Uh, so, so, although that was never supposed to happen. So I yeah. want that bag. Really, it's a Timbuktu messenger bag. As much as I love it, go buy one. Were, uh, so, were they a sponsor for you? No. No? I, I knew people at the brand. Um, I, I knew the company. I'd worked with them on other stuff. Um, in social, and when I had the idea, the idea was I want to follow a bag around the world. I said, well, why a bag? I said, because a bag's always going to go with you. A bag can do whatever it wants to do. Because That's it's awesome. not a person. It's like a cartoon. I'm following something. Here's the bag skateboarding in Australia. Here is the bag with the Eiffel Tower. Here is the bag sleeping in business class on a Kenyan Airways 787. Here's the bag in China. Here's the bag in Tokyo. Actually, here's the bag lost in Tokyo. Uh, I mean, oh, you know, we just, I made a whole story. It's a, it's a great I a, idea. I like it. And right. people could relate to the bag. <laughs> the next project that I, if we can get it finalized, is going to be shot from the first person point of view of travel. So it's going to be shot how you see the world. If you're sitting down, you're going to see, well, presumably mine, because I'm a photographer, um, you know, legs and hands. You're sitting and looking out the window on the plane, you'll see the shoulder. Everything is from that point of view. You'll never see the traveler, but you see it from that traveler's point of view. Because when you think about things, if you're working, you see your hands. If you're sitting somewhere, you see your shoulders, your feet. You see your chest if you're laying down. Mm-hmm. Everything will be shot from the point of view of a first-person traveler. Hmm. Because that way, anybody looking at it can go out and see the world, thinking about it. That's how I see the world. That's neat. That's, that's, I like the idea. Well, I mean, you know, it's, again, it's one of those things where you have the marketing people looking at it going, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> How do we like that? Or not. <laughs> you know? That's when you have to remember what the emperor said. You will pay for your lack of vision. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he said lots of things that I love to tell my kids. But that's a whole different thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But, I'm, you know, that, that's where I come at the visual, the corporate style for me, is I want people to put themselves where, where I am. Yeah. I don't want them to think about anything else, and I don't want it to be a clean photo. It, you don't see clean things when you open your eyes and look out the world. No, no. You know, and, and it's a real-time environment, um, and that's the social puts a whole different level on that. And telling a story, I've got to tell you, going around the world in real time is kind of funky. Well, telling, I mean, telling a story is probably one of the most powerful mediums of getting anything across to people, right? So. It is, you know, and, and, a corpor- and I think most people uh, don't see that as an option for corporate photography. I think a lot of photographers don't get that because they're so focused on the Annie Leibovitz million-dollar photo shoots with everybody else. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the art directors have this vision in their head of, okay, we can make everything look natural. Here's an idea. Just have it happen naturally. Yeah. yeah. You know, don't overthink it. And I think, you know, Instagram's a whole different, and, and it's bizarre. I mean, I come from the world of newspapers and wire services, which wire services especially are as fast as you can go. <laughs> and then I went into the corporate side of things, which slows the pace down heavily. And now I am back into shooting projects on Instagram for corporations, which is faster than wire services. <laughs> You know, yeah. and with the Instagram, I'm dealing with the Instagram, the Twitter, and the Facebook simultaneously. So you're having conversations while shooting, while trying to figure out your next shot. Because you have no idea what's in front of you. I mean, walking through Tokyo, I nearly missed my photo, and that was a photo that people at the Sky Team found hysterical because they realized my caption was real, which is, I took a left turn, I don't know where I am, where the hell is the train station, my flight's in two hours. <laughs> but see, you know, that's what's... So- like, it was like, welcome to Sky Team around the world. I mean, it was whatever the caption was, was really my frantic, like, oh my God, I'm going to miss my flight. But I mean, it's, <laughs> it's engaging because people relate to it and it's a real story, you know? It is, you know, and, and it's a whole different medium. Yeah. You know, you, you put your photos up wherever you're going to put them up. I, I, they need to stand without a caption on their own to get someone's attention because the average attention span of a Twitter user is a little under no, 2.7 seconds. Attention span of an Instagram user is a little under two seconds right now. Average Facebook user is a little over three seconds. So think about the amount of time you have to catch someone's attention who, if you're looking at TweetDeck or Hootsuite, is staring at nine tweets at the same time. 
<laughs> or if they're rolling through Instagram, can look at up to two photos simultaneously on the screen, what's going to make them stop and look at yours and read your caption? Yeah, it's a photo. And that caption has to tell that story. Yeah. So they're going to come back and keep looking at you because photographers want attention. You know what the real key is? not attention. It's retention. <laughs> and So what's your favorite social media? I like the banter on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I, well, you see me on Facebook a lot. My Facebook is locked and private. Yeah. My photos are all private. Nobody gets in who I don't know, and I shed more people than I add. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that's not really a medium. Well, um, yeah. When it comes to business, I hate Facebook. Your uh, organic growth is right around 6% of your actual audience. Yeah. Unless you're doing pay-for-play, which I can't stand. Yeah. Uh, Twitter, I like to use. I mean, I run the uh, the TNI, the Traveler's Night in Traveler's Chat. Uh, TNI is the longest-running travel chat on Twitter. Uh, it's every Thursday at 3.30 Eastern. Feel free to show up. Okay. Um, and uh, But Instagram, for me, really, I mean, it, it's... Interestingly, Instagram has almost 20 times the rate of engagement than Facebook. Technically, Instagram has a higher rate of engagement than Twitter, except Twitter has conversations and Instagram doesn't. Yeah. So it's hard to say my favorite. Personally, I would say I enjoy Twitter. When it comes to work, I'd say Instagram. Yeah. When it comes to anything, I would say it's never Facebook. <laughs> and, and I'm assuming you don't even think about Vine because that's all video. Can't stand Vine. Yeah. Um, plus, the eight-second limit's annoying. Six, isn't it? Oh, yeah, right. I know what it is. Yeah. I really, I, I used Vine for, I want to say, two days um, and then decided I wanted to kill myself. I've tried it, and I don't get it, but... <laughs> At least Instagram, you know, the video gives you the audio and gives you other stuff. I mean, so it's a, it's a far more effective tool. I think 15 seconds, you can tell a story. Um, I like it. The, the hyperlapse which Instagram has. Yeah. I don't think that's used enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to see more people playing with it with the hyperlapse. Um, but I mean, video for me, it really doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. And I, I have a hard time explaining to clients why I don't like video and why they shouldn't either. <laughs> um, although, Many of them, when we get down to the numbers, will finally, they may not listen to what I'm saying, my reasoning why, but once I say, okay, we'll do this for a week your way and a week my way, and then we sit down and go, here are the numbers. Numbers can't lie. Here's all my raw data. And they love the numbers. When I hand people numbers, and I always try to show them the raw information as well, because they can look, here's my numbers, here's how I got my numbers. You can have your, you know, your own people go look at this, and we'll come out to the same place. Yeah. And it's always, uh, okay, you know what? Uh, your idea's not like that. <laughs> so, but yeah. I mean, I've been doing it long enough. And I said, no, since 1994, it's, it's really, my first, my first airline social media project was before Twitter and before Instagram and before Facebook. Yeah. So try running airline social when you don't have those three channels existing yet. <laughs> it was a... Uh, I want to... Uh, um, we're, I, I get the feeling we could talk for another two hours, and I'd love to have you back for another interview. But I think I want to ra- start wrapping things up here. But what I want to make sure, um, what's the best site for people to uh, to find your stuff that you would direct them to? Is it Flying With Fish? Flying With Fish is my blog. It's been around since 2006. It was started for photographers and is now primarily focused on aviation security, although I still do with photographer issues. Um, but Twitter. Twitter. And Twitter and Instagram. What's your uh, Twitter handle? Flying with fish for both of them. Oh, okay. For Instagram and Twitter. I'm pretty consistent. Awesome. Well, some I know for myself, sometimes I've got into things late and I don't get the name I want to stay consistent. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of people who want flying with fish. <laughs> well, I'll, well, we'll get those links below for people to check you out. And uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. Would I think we'd definitely love to get you back in for another one. And, um, but, uh, we'll wrap this up now. And I just want to thank you very much for, uh, you're our, you're our first in the new interview series that I'm, that we're doing with, uh, photographers and videographers and image creators here on part of the image. Putting people to sleep so early in your series, it's got to be great. <laughs> no, actually, I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's a uh, much more engaging one. Cause, uh, you know, as we talked before, you're, uh, 
we're both kind of not traditional people. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, new and interesting stuff that, you know, people maybe haven't considered, especially in the amount of stuff we covered in the interview. So, Well, hopefully I can come back to the point and make sense of what I just said. <laughs> For sure. So that concludes our interview with Fish, Stephen Frischling, first in our new Art of the Image radio series, where we'll be interviewing some of the world's most interesting, some of the world's best, some of the world's most fascinating image creators, whether they're photographers, videographers, artists, graphic artists, you name it. We're going to try and get them all here on Art of the Image. Well, maybe not all of them. There's a lot. But uh, if you're interested in being on the show, uh, drop us a line. You can email us at theartoftheimage at gmail.com and let us know. And uh, stay tuned. We'll be back soon with more great interviews.